Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is number 17 in an ongoing playlist of videos about comic book creation, kind of pulling back the curtain and uh, showing you some of the thought processes behind creating comics. Uh, and, you know, you can either use this if you want to create comics yourself, uh, or it can just give you a deeper appreciation as you read comics. Now, today's uh, topic is going to be the point of view uh, or the camera angle that a comic creator chooses for each individual panel. Uh, in my book, Mastering Manga, to. There's quite a long uh, section about comic book creation, and uh, one of the pages is on this topic here of uh, camera angles. Now here you see a scene where there's a, a butler uh, and a guy, an uh, old man, reading a paper over here, and it's presented kind of just like a stage play from left to right. You see what's going on. Now here's the exact same scene from an aerial point of view. We've pulled way up, almost above the ceiling, to look down and show the exact same scene. And uh, uh, down here we have rather more dramatic ways of approaching it. We uh, have pulled the camera around to show the old man's face uh, to reveal that he's not really paying attention to the butler. We maybe start to think, hmm, something menacing going on here. And then here may be the most menacing way of presenting it uh, uh, of them all, where we see this knife in the foreground and the hand and so forth. So just to show you that uh, any given scene can be presented in, you know, literally hundreds of different ways. Now, my first uh, example, many of them indeed, are going to come from my Brody's Ghost series. And uh, let me go ahead and uh, bring out uh, piece of advice number one. You must always think first and foremost about what you want the reader to see. Now that may seem obvious, but it isn't necessarily for the beginning comics creator. And I've just uh, brought out an example uh, scene here uh, from Brody's Ghost, hopefully not too much of a spoiler, but this, uh, this unusual demi-ghost character is uh, shown reaching over to this cauldron uh, and pulling out this burning hot sort of, uh, what do you call one of those uh, things for branding? I guess it's a brand, a fire brand. Uh, so each one of these, um, you know, we, we give the basic scene here, here we zoom in to show the fire brand. Each one of these I'm thinking about what do I want the reader to see. Oh, I want the reader to see Brody's reaction. I want to see that he's this uh, demi ghost character is moving uh, over towards Brody. I want to show the intensification of his fear uh, and so forth and cutting away to other characters. All of this is based on what do I need the uh, uh, reader to see. Uh, as we build towards this moment where his, you know, Brody's hand is strapped down and uh, we <laughs> move in to uh, show the brand getting closer and closer to his um, palm. And then what do I do? Oh, I pull all the way back, super far distance, where we just hear the sound of uh, Brody screaming. We don't show the uh, violent, gory... <laughs> <laughs> uh, moment, and that's uh, all of this is a choice uh, in me thinking yeah, maybe a little more effective to just leave this to the imagination uh, of the reader. Uh, so that's um, rule number one, quite a uh, generalized rule, but something you really should always be thinking about. What do I want the reader to see? So number two, for establishing shots, we often pull way back to introduce the reader to the environment, but not always. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the sort of basic concept here. Uh, again, from Brody's Ghost, we have this scene where Brody and Talia the ghost are up on this um, decaying overpass. And so I pull the camera uh, way, way back uh, to establish the scene. We barely see Brody and Talia at all. This is all about the scene giving the reader a sense of location before we begin to zoom in and uh, get a closer look at uh, Brody and Talia as they begin talking to one another. Now, that, this is the basic way of doing it, and, um, you know, you can see it makes sense. Uh, get the reader to understand where this scene is taking place. Um, you know, put that out in great detail at the beginning, then you don't have to keep drawing it again and again. The reader, you know, sort of holds that image uh, in their brain as they continue to read. Uh, but that is not um, always the way that you uh, begin a scene. This is kind of a mini scene within a scene, I suppose, but Brody uh, sort of bribes his way uh, into this back room uh, where he's going to be uh, trying to procure a certain object. And this is kind of the end of, a, uh, of the first part of this scene. And then we immediately cut 
not to an establishing shot of the room, but to this very tight close-up of an object. Um, and then uh, from there we can sort of pull back and give uh, readers a, a slightly better sense of what this room is like. In fact, there really is no uh, establishing shot of this back room that shows in great detail what that room looks like. I felt like it just wasn't that important for this scene. But I did like this slightly cinematic approach, and you'll see this in movies, where sometimes the scene begins with a tight close-up on an object, uh, something that's going to be important or sort of driving the action forward. So, uh, just to show you, there are exceptions to that idea uh, of the big, wide establishing shot. Number three, for dialogue we often move in closer to show facial expressions. Uh, and so uh, here's a quick example of that. Brody has climbed up this utility pole, uh, sort of peeking through this window, and um, uh, sure enough we begin to move in a little closer uh, so that we can see his facial expressions, and then as we get uh, deep into the dialogue, uh, it is primarily uh, close-up uh, scenes, fairly tight in so that we can see the facial expressions and the changes uh, that occur uh, throughout this conversation. You know, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a law, but uh, I think it's pretty unusual to do a dialogue scene without any close-ups uh, of this kind. Um, if you did an entire dialogue scene from a, a distance in which we really really don't see their faces much at all, I would regard that as um, experimental, basically. It can be done, but it's uh, pretty unconventional. Number four, when presenting things from a particular character's point of view, that character may or may not still be in the frame. Here's an example, again, from Brody's ghost, and uh, we've got uh, Brody uh, looking at the ghost, Talia, um, and, you know, technically speaking, the camera, such as it is, is behind Brody's shoulder. We're not seeing exactly what Brody is seeing, but, you know, this is primarily presented from Brody's point of view, and by including him in the shot, we sort of get a sense of the spatial relationship between these two characters. Now, you may choose uh, that approach, or you may actually go for uh, the actual real point of view shot in which we see what the character sees. Uh, and I would say that's what this is here from Miki Falls. Uh, my character Miki is uh, looking at a character named Anra, uh, and uh, in this scene, I don't know if we're going to say it's from anyone's particular point of view, uh, but here certainly I would say we are seeing what Miki is seeing. Uh, and periodically you may um, decide that that is the most effective uh, use of the panel. Number five, an aerial point of view can provide a map for the reader. Also, it can simply add variety to a dialogue scene. Now, there's a little bit of overlap between this video and other videos that I've done, but I'm, I'm trying to use different examples to give you a, a deeper understanding. Um, this is the first example of this sort of map uh, thing, and let me sort of pull back here. Brody arrives at this house, and we uh, see the house, and uh, in frame is this tree with a swing hanging down from it. But I can't be 100% sure that the reader is going to pay attention to that swing at this stage. So I'm very careful uh, in planning out this scene to uh, show, you know, Brody's uh, progression toward the house. Uh, he's looking off to one side, and here is my aerial shot, in which I just want to make sure that everyone understands. Here's the path that was shown on the other page, here's the tree, here's the swing, here's Brody heading toward it. So this aerial view really does kind of give the, the reader a, a very clear map of, of where everybody is and what's going on, and then he can proceed to the next part of the scene where he sort of interacts with this uh, swing. Now that is um, the classic, you know, map approach. Uh, and you may find it when it's crucial for your reader to know where things are that that's what you're using it for. Other times, though, and I'm going to return uh, to this scene that I showed before, other times you're just kind of spicing things up a little bit because uh, we can get tired of just showing the uh, faces of the characters again and again. So why is this aerial view here? Mainly just to give us a break from looking at only Brody's face and Talia's face. So again and again I keep pulling back to uh, an aerial point of view. Um, that, I would say, really just aesthetically to, to make these pages more interesting uh, to look at. Number six, and this is kind of a continuation of the last point. Uh, in dialogue scenes, you may wish to avoid talking head syndrome. Consider shifting focus away from the faces periodically. So yes, if you have a, a face after face after face, 
um, in a dialogue scene, it can get very repetitive. And so uh, the aerial view is one way of spicing things up. Here's another one where uh, this guy Landon James in the Brody's Ghost series uh, reaches down to pick up his glass of scotch or whatever it is. And for one frame, we don't see any faces at all. We just see the hand uh, taking hold of the glass. So um, I think that uh, that's another way of getting away from doing face after face after face in these dialogue scenes. And you just have to sort of uh, keep your eyes open for the opportunities to, to cut away from the faces and show something different. Number seven, pulling back can help to suggest time passing, especially when there is no dialogue. Now this is something that I've only discovered recently myself. Uh, and uh, I've started to use it um, uh, periodically uh, in my comics. Here, uh, again from Brody's Ghost, the scene where Brody and Landon are talking, and at one point I pull back and give us an aerial view, but it's not so much the aerial view that I want to focus on here as the idea that we have, we've gone back a great distance, there's no dialogue in this panel, uh, and there is something about uh, pulling way back that uh, conveys time passing, I feel, um, and it's almost the equivalent of two or three panels in which nothing happens. Um, just by pulling way back, there's something about that uh, that, for me, gives the feeling of time uh, passing by that it wouldn't happen if we were, uh, you know, in really close on one or both of their faces. Number eight, an extreme close-up turns the drama up to 11. Uh, and I know that I did cover this a little bit in one of these other videos, but I didn't really show a truly extreme close-up uh, in, in that video. Here is what I would call more of an extreme close-up from the Mickey Falls series. Uh, at one point, we just pull so close in on her eyes that they're, they're taking up the entire width of the page, basically. Um, and uh, it can only be justified, I would say, by a big turning point in the story or a moment of truly huge drama that um, requires that level of close-up. You, you do have to be careful about overusing it. If you're resorting to close-ups all the time, uh, you drain them of their power and they don't mean anything. But um, certainly uh, I felt at this key turning point in the story it was uh, justified. Number nine, to show a single action in the clearest way possible, don't change the point of view. Sometimes you're dealing with a fairly complicated sequence of events, and I always want to make sure uh, that the reader understands what's happening. Uh, at all times. And so I had this scene where Brody is running into this alleyway. We see the beginning of the alleyway. We see the other side of it. And we're like, okay, he's trying to get through. And uh, over here, rather than getting too flashy about it, I basically present Brody's point of view, what he's seeing. And in the next uh, frame, it's exactly the same point of view, except one thing has changed. This police car, woo, comes into view. That's just, uh, uh, you know, making things crystal clear to the reader and then uh, basically do the same thing here with the, his entrance to the alleyway, showing uh, essentially the exact same point of view, only this time, again, the police car is coming in. And uh, just as an extra thing that I did is I put in this uh, signpost here to make one side of the alleyway look different from the other. That's not so much a point of view thing as more of like a, a map kind of thing or a clarity uh, aspect. But certainly, if I had done slightly different points of view or switched to, uh, you know, set my aerial or whatever uh, point of view, uh, I would have thrown things off. Uh, sometimes you just want clarity, uh, and that's when you keep the point of view exactly the same. And finally, number 10, uh, keep your eyes open for unusual shots that are made possible by the particular scene you have written. Uh, this one comes from Miki Falls. I had a scene where Miki is hunting around this library, looking for these other two characters, and uh, incidentally we have a sort of a, I think it's called a Dutch angle shot, where you tilt the camera uh, to add to the mystery. That's something you can consider. But really what I want to talk about is this idea of uh, uh, doing a shot be between books on a shelf, you know, sort of creating a gap on the bookshelf shelf so as to uh, have uh, Miki see, partially see, these characters on the other side. And I continued that uh, over here uh, in this panel, and even one last uh, time in this panel over here. Uh, basically, you know, you just uh, have to be aware of what's made possible. You know, I had this idea of a library, so here's my chance to do this kind of tricky shot through the books on the shelves. Uh, and I'll give you one more example. This is from uh, uh, Brody's Ghost. There's a scene where these windows start shattering for some mysterious reason. I won't uh, give that away, but there uh, uh, occurred to me the possibility of uh, doing one shot down here 
um, through one of the shattered windows, as if you got a cameraman up there on the second floor uh, and uh, used the shattered glass as a framing device. Certainly, yeah, uh, you're always looking for some interesting visual way of presenting information. It is a visual medium, so um, just keep your eyes open. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want every shot to be tricky, but certainly when you have the chance to do something interesting, you should go ahead and grab it. Well, uh, that's the end of this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching it. I really hope you enjoyed it. I apologize for those of you that were waiting seven days for another How to Draw video. Every once in a while, I do like to do a video like this. Uh, more of a general introduction, help people appreciate uh, the behind-the-scenes uh, work that goes into creating comics. Uh, but uh, definitely next week I'll be back with another How to Draw video. So thanks again for watching this one. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with another one real soon.